It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat, Mary Jo Foley are here. We've got the final results from the Build Conference, including a look at Windows 8 Server. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 227, recorded September 22nd, 2011. We're having twins. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your used gadgets. And Newegg.com, the place on the internet to shop for tech. Gazelle it today and receive a gift card from Newegg at Newegg.com slash trade. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code Windows9. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management. That's simple. Upgrade to a premium account and trade in your old clunkers. Visit windows.hover.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the latest from Redmond and points north, south, east, and west. Mary Jo Foley is here from all things Microsoft, all about Microsoft.com. All about Microsoft.com. Hi, MJ. Hi, how You're are back you? home. Yes. Survived your build experience. Thank goodness. <laughs> Did you bring one of the kegs back with you? <laughs> I brought some of those bean bags back with me. They're like all piled up behind me. I want to. I want Paul to tell us a story behind that. Paul Thorat is also here. He's back home as well. Paul Thorat, the editor in chief of the Super Site for Windows Win Super Site dot com. Hello. I know sir. nothing. So you you we have it on video. I, if only there were some proof. <laughs> At first, I thought, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're, something's going on at the conference. They're setting something up. And then I realized it was you, sir. You were the problem. Uh, it was while <laughs> well, Joe was interviewing, um, I can't remember who it was. Was it Tom? Warren, yeah. it was Tom, Tom Warren. Mm -hmm. And the, these so, beanbags are piling up. I will tell you, what, what do you call them? Beanbags. They start oh. piling up. So, I'll tell you two things about it. One was that Raphael and, and, and Stephen Chapman and I think uh, Sandro... Oh, sure, it was their idea. Had, de ...had determined that they were going to do something while Tom was on, and I wanted to make sure that it was not disrespectful. Oh. And then when they told me what it was, I said, that's not enough, we need to do more than that. <laughs> <laughs> what were they going to do? <laughs> they, just, they said something like, "Let's uh, we'll build a beanbag chair, you know, castle behind Tom <laughs> as if we were robots. And I said, that that's cute. But I said, afterwards, we need to destroy it. <laughs> I like the leaping. The leaping and jumping. <laughs> yeah. So you're back from Build and had time now to play a little bit more with the developer's preview of uh, Windows I haven't really 8. looked at it much, you know. It's been, <laughs> it's oh, been you've all Windows 7. You've probably since. written it. Oh, here's here's video of the beanbag fort going up. How, boy, you're you're fast, Alex. Look at that. This is the beanbag for it. But this is my favorite part. In a moment, <laughs> Paul is going to leap into that beanbag for it and destroy it. I hit it once and I didn't even dent it. So I said, I really, I'm going to have to really move at it. <laughs> Boom! Let's see. Yeah, that's Stephen Chapman. <laughs> you need somebody a little, a little more beefy. Stephen Chapman's not big enough. Not big enough. No. Boom! And there we go. Paul Thorat <laughs> with For the Win. <laughs> And I was so intently listening to Tom, I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> the chat room had to tell me about it. Well, and then they told me to keep a straight face during it all. Yeah. I knew it was going to happen. And I'm, like, trying not to laugh because I'm watching in the camera, like, what was going on behind us? And Tom is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now, the chat room wants to know, was there a slingshot to fire you, Paul? No, I have incredible leaping ability. <laughs> yeah, because you were good. I used to be able to dunk a basketball when I was young. <laughs> He's the dunker. So um, uh, let's start by, uh, first of all, um, anything more to say now that you've played a little bit more with, uh, with Windows 8? Uh, any, any more insights into it? Uh, you know, all the attention really went to not that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> See, it's the, it's, the, it's the prank that keeps on pranking. It is. I, I feel like if you're going to do something, you, you got to really go for it. <laughs> there's, there's Raphael. I, it's Tim. <laughs> it's, it's amateur hour back there. <laughs> I love it. Three stars no, I just, every they, level. They, they, they were like, we're going to build a castle. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like, well, that's it. I'm like, no, that's not it. We're asking, uh, Quake, Quaker Ninja's asking for an animated GIFs that we can all post on Google+. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. So, um, when, Windows 8, one more time. <laughs> oh, Windows 8. <laughs> um, uh, what more have we learned? What more could we say? What more can we say? I mean, really, all the focus was on the start uh, screen. Well, you know, right. And actually, I have to say... Uh, I, I've spoken to people at Microsoft, uh, you know, on and off the record since the, the, the public stuff. And, and after coming to a deeper understanding, I, you know, to, and I should give credit as much as it pains me to uh, Mary Jo for <laughs> being among the first to say, is this Windows R Win RT, the Windows runtime, is this a replacement for Win32? And uh, I, she was the first person I ever heard voice this question. And at the time, it was very confusing because I don't know that we had a... I have a clear understanding of it after that reviewer's workshop or after the, the keynote. But in talking with Microsoft uh, privately, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> very much it is. And, and, and in some ways, this ch that change um, makes this a much bigger release than I previously understood. Mm -hmm. And for, for, for reasons that are a little complex to explain, but I, I, if I could uh, try to get through it quickly, it kind of boils down to this notion of, you know, Microsoft says they're reimagining Windows. And that sounds like a cute marketing term, but really, they're replacing the entire Windows shell. They're replacing the entire Windows runtime engine uh, with something new. And they really haven't done that in the case of the shell since Windows 95. I mean, that was the, the big um, user experience change, right, from program manager. And then from a developer standpoint, you know, they haven't really changed it ever. You know, Win32 has been around since 1993 with Windows NT, their first version of NT. Um, it's based on what they retroactively named the Win16 APIs that preceded it from the classic uh, DOS-based version of Windows. So, I mean, that, that API has been in Windows essentially forever. And obviously it's in Windows 8, but they're not really updating it. To, to have replaced that with a new runtime, one that will now form the basis or the foundation for the next, you know, whatever it is, 10, 15 years, um, that's a monumental change. And I think that's something that developers and, and enthusiasts are are only now starting to understand. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. I feel like that was like the big kind of hidden thing at the conference. I mean, it wasn't hidden in a way because there were so many sessions about how to write apps for Metro and all, but um, I don't think people really digested how, how big a deal this was going to be until they kind of sat back and looked at it and said, oh, wait, like we're we're going to be doing everything differently pretty much. Yep. If we're going to write a Metro app, it's, it's uh, like it's, night and day. Yeah. It's a hundred percent different. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, uh, uh, to give you a comparison that maybe you'll appreciate from the Mac side, uh, obviously when Apple transitioned to Mac OS 10, they provided a, uh, a classic environment for running the old apps. That was essentially an emulation environment. Um, but cons and so really not the same as uh, it's working in windows eight, but conceptually it's the same thing where, from the perspective of the new Windows shell, you know, I asked Microsoft, I said, so you've got this start screen thing, you know. Okay, the start screen, I got it. But what do you call this this thing that it, run, it runs in an environment of some kind? You know, what is that? And they said, it's just the Windows shell. There's no special name for it. It's the Windows shell. Okay. So I said, but what about the desktop then? I mean, the desktop runs, you know, within it, next to it, above it, below it. I mean, how does that work? And they basically said, you know, you're really not thinking of it this of this the right way that from the perspective of this new Windows shell, the desktop is just another app. And that is sort of how classic worked in Mac OS X, right? That that thing was a self-contained environment. Technologically, these are completely different things, but conceptually the same thing where you could, in Mac OS X, if I remember correctly, a, a basically crash system nine or whatever it was called, and everything within that would die, but it wouldn't affect the, you know, the rest of the operating system. That's right, it was but that's a sort of how, yeah, that was sort of how it was done. And in many ways, you know, uh, that's essentially what's happening here in Windows 8. Um, it's not, again, it's not technically the same thing. I know people, I'll get pedantic emails from people about that, but conceptually, it is the same thing. You know, to the Windows shell, the new Windows shell, um, that desktop environment is, a, is one app. You know, you can't multitask between 
uh, a new app, uh, a tailored Metro style app, and a desktop app. You can only multitask between, and I, I mean like switch apps, between a Metro style app and another Metro style app or a Metro style app and the entire Windows desktop and whatever is running within that. You know, you don't, those things that are running within it are not considered their own apps, if you will, to the shell anymore. It's a, it's a big, it's a big conceptual change. It is. And then, you know, the other kind of oversimplification that I think a lot of people started out with that build and now are starting to figure out is um, Metro apps are not going to be only consumer apps. Like a lot, right. of, I saw a lot of people saying, you know, oh, so Metro is all the games and the fun apps and the social apps, and then the the desktop apps are the real business apps. But that's that distinction actually is not correct either. Um, Microsoft's trying to convince people who have enterprise apps to rewrite them to be Metro apps. Um, what are, you know, it's, rewrite is kind of a vague and loaded term there, but I mean, they're they're trying to convince people, yeah, we're going to let you run your app as a desktop app, but we really would like to convince you that the future is Metro and we want you to go Metro. And on that note, I would say the one thing maybe Microsoft didn't communicate very well, well, one of the things, is this notion that Metro can be used for anything more than these sort of Fisher-Price looking web apps. You know, uh, I think a lot of people are drawing this distinction between, um, uh, you know, the complexity or, uh, you know, sophistication of a professional app like Adobe Photoshop. You know, people are saying, well, you'll never be able to do Photoshop in this thing. And unfortunately, you know, <laughs> in trying to prove how simple it was to develop for this environment, they carted out these interns that supposedly over the summer created all these sample apps. And look how easy that was. But of course, all the sample apps are these, you know, really simple looking iPad looking things. And people are like, oh, geez, you know, we're never going to have anything professional. And, you know, I, I wish they had done some more professional looking sample apps because I think the you know one of the many things that people don't get now is the sheer amount of capability uh, that you get the sheer amount of capabilities that you get uh, through this metro style you know user experience and now the developers have it we're going to see those things so um, you know next time around whenever it is the beta or if there's a refresh uh, for this developer preview or however they do it I think by that time you know the store will be open we'll have some you know, more sample apps and of course apps from actual third-party developers and everything uh, hopefully we'll get the Microsoft apps in there because, you know, I, I, I did a demonstration of Windows 8 last night for a user group locally. And one of the things I pointed out was, you know, on this default star screen, 70% of it is sample apps that aren't even going to ship in Windows 8. And what you're not getting here are, A, the apps that are going to ship in Windows 8. And then, B, you know, the Windows Live apps and stuff that are going to ship along with Windows 8. You know, the mail, photos, people, calendar, etc. You know, that stuff is a big part of the experience. So... Um, as you're, you're clicking around on the screen here, if you look at that thing, you know, the build app, the weather app, the socializer app, the tweet, uh, whatever the tweet, Twitter app stocks. Those Tweet-a-rama, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. those things are not Windows 8 apps. They're, they're not they're part of the operating system. They're just demo. They're literally just there yep. so there's something to fill the screen. And yeah. to give you an idea of some of the possibilities. Right. Yep. Let me, you know, Loic Lemur was on uh, Twit. Uh, he was down there with his Seismic team. He's the, he's the CEO and founder of Seismic. Yep. And, of course, they're a, a developer for Windows 8, so he was down there as a developer. Uh, he mm -hmm. said his developers are a little upset because it looked like it was going to be difficult to take a Metro app developed for Windows Phone 7 and, and do it on right. Windows 8. It was very... Mm -hmm. So when you say Metro app, you mean it may I mean, be uh, Metro yeah. for Windows 8 as opposed to Metro for Windows right. Phone. They're, well, they're very specifically not even really called, they, they're calling them Metro style apps. I, I think the correct terminology is actually they're, they're tailored apps or immersive apps. Um, they're just apps that run under the Windows, you know, the new Windows runtime. I, I wish there was a very a clearer way of saying what those things are. And, and maybe Mary Jo remembers, but between WPF, which is one set of uh, developer libraries for, that are based on .NET and Silverlight, which is sort of the other one, uh, one of the two is very easy to port, and I, I thought it was Silverlight, but I, the other one is not. Um, hmm. So now on the flip side, regardless of which one of those you've learned, those programming skills all come across because the, the, the WinRT libraries are of the same style, right? They're, they're, style, they're um, .NET style, object-oriented, you know, mm -hmm. programming libraries and frameworks. And are, uh, apparently if you have... 
uh, familiarity with either one of those, it should be a pretty easy transition. When, is Win RT the kernel, or is this the this is more a framework? So it's not. It's actually not either. So it's <laughs> it sits on top of the kernel, and it, it it does provide a set of libraries for developers. It's an analogous to Windows uh, Win32, meaning that it is something that sits directly on top of the kernel and is thus uh, essentially native code, native the native programming environment or the native runtime environment. Right. So, Leo, if you're not afraid of an architectural diagram. <laughs> I'm not. I love architectural diagrams. So do I. Um, go, go on to my website, and I have a, a post there that says something like, here's the slide everybody wanted to redo. And I put up oh, the version <laughs> of the diagram. Right. Microsoft showed a diagram, right, that was very oversimplified and kind of like a architecture diagram. But since then, a whole number of folks who were at build have tried to redraw this picture and um, you can kind of get a better idea of where when rt sits if you look at some of these other um, renditions of this picture um, yeah so I, I by the way i spoke with them privately about that and there were people at microsoft who were very upset about this diagram because it was so inaccurate <laughs> um, what, the, the way that they described it was, well, the Wasn't left it side their the, side, slide? No, well, yes. yes. So the theirs. marketing people kind of won out because they wanted to oversimplify it. So the left side of the diagram, once you see it, is correct. It's the, the part with WinRT, although it omits the DirectX part of it, um, but it's basically correct. Right, so you see the green box? Yeah. yeah. That's correct. The only thing that is missing there is that in addition to the C, XAML, C Sharp stuff, and then the HTML, CSS stuff, there's actually a third column of green boxes that could go there, which would represent DirectX. If you look yep. at the light blue side, Internet Explorer does not sit on <laughs> top of the core right. OS services, for example. That sits on top of Win32 and possibly on top of other frameworks. You know, .NET, go, down, go down one. Go down, go this down is, one this slide This is the here. better this way to, to do look it. Look at this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, there's DirectX. Let's there's a the CLR, the here. Common Language Runtime. So this this one's a way better picture. This is from um, a guy who used to work at Microsoft who doesn't work there anymore. He works for Telerik now. His name is Doug Seven. He, he drew this one. Okay. Yeah. So... Let's that see. makes a lot more sense, actually. It does. Except, well, <laughs> except that even in that one, Internet Explorer is sitting next to Win32, which is not correct, it and on top of the Windows kernel services, which is yeah. also not correct. You know, yeah. it's sure. it's hard to... It's it, it, The problem it's is... It's not you, so linear draw, is what it is. Right. So. When you try to draw this as it really is, it's not very clean. What, what they were trying to do was show people conceptually where things lined up. You know, that if you were doing this before, here's what it looks like in the new world. And I, I think... I guess I sort of understand that, but... You know, they just, uh, you know, this is a developer audience. So these people look at this and of course they're all, everyone's sitting in the crowd saying, oh no, I'm sorry, that's not correct. You know, <laughs> and, the, and now they stop listening because what they see is not correct. So that's where their brain is. And I think that was, uh, you can't let the marketers uh, win that argument when you're speaking in front of developers. Yeah. So if you're, for instance, if you're coding in DirectX, you'll, your, your view is DirectX, your model controller is C and C++, that, along with all the other coding, sits on top of the WinRT APIs, uh, which sits on top of kernel services. That makes sense. Th those layers yeah, make and, sense. And so what that yeah. means is, well, and, and, one, and again, one of the many things they didn't communicate very well, imagine a game like Gears of War 3 or the next Call of Duty or whatever. That type of game would be possible, it would be very possible to implement that in WinRT, right? It would be exactly the same, except for one thing. You would get all of those additional services that WinRT apps, and I don't know of a better way to call it, you know, metro style apps get. In other words, you could get those edge UIs. You could get access to the charms. You know, it would be possible in that game to do something like share that you just completed a level and, and achieved an Xbox Live achievement with your friends on Facebook using those contracts that are built into Windows 8. So, People, uh, you know, they look at this WinRT thing and they think, oh, well, yeah, this would be very nice for a bingo game, but uh, or maybe Hangman, but not for Gears of War 3, when in fact it would be possible and will in the future happen uh, that people will use WinRT for that stuff. Well, and DirectX still is, 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 it's not gone. Actually, if you, it, this is, Mary Jo, you did a great job. If anybody wants to understand this, read the blog post uh, at All About Microsoft because because you have like eight different versions of the same slide, <laughs> depending on depending on your perspective and your point of view. Yeah, it's just like it's like a Darwinian uh, investigation. <laughs> yeah, 
But I yeah. think this this becomes m much clearer when I read what you what you wrote here, and I look at the slides. Well, that's good. Good yeah. to hear. Yeah. And you know, so the another thing we haven't really talked about yet, but you know, we're talking a lot about the metro apps. But a lot of people I've been talking to since Build wanted to know more about the desktop apps. Also, like, like say you're an enterprise developer or even a consumer app developer, and you don't want to do the metro style app. Um, a lot of there's been a lot of confusion around: Will you be able to do a classic? desktop app on both Intel Windows 8 machines and ARM Windows 8 machines. <laughs> um, yeah, no Paul's way. like, oh no, she's going there. <laughs> there's, no, there's absolutely no way this is going to cost. But please continue. Okay. I'm going to continue because <laughs> I am not exactly sure how this is possible, but it is going to happen. But why do you and say I'm 100 percent. I, I can't tell you why I am 100% sure, but just right, go but with me Let me, me, let me explain. It. Well, but uh, this before you get to that, the reason it's not, I don't believe it could possibly be true, you know, aside from the rumors about how maybe it's not going to have the desktop, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, there are pieces of the Windows shell that can come through on top of Metro, and there are only a few of them. One of them's Task Manager. Um, mm -hmm. And that suggests to me that they've thought about a, a world in which you don't see the desktop. But aside from that, for, that, for a developer to be able to create a traditional desktop application that ran on an ARM, they would have to have a compiler that could could target each of the many ARM variant platforms that, that this thing works on. And those don't exist. There's a, um, there's a cross compiler in Visual Studio 11, the developer preview, that a lot of people don't realize is there. It's for ARM. Well, except that for it to actually work on, on hardware that's going to ship with Windows 8 on it, it has to be custom tailored for each one of those devices. Yeah. And maybe they're going to do think that, this maybe is not. Um, I, I didn't think it was possible either, and I kind of thought, um, you know, we had seen some videos and some um, screenshots of uh, the, the Windows 8 running on ARM because nobody would actually uh, let anyone touch those tablets. They, they said they weren't ready yet at build. But there is a desktop icon uh, or live tile on those, and I just thought maybe it was a placeholder or something they were going to take right. away when developer preview comes out it's not it's real and that they're you gonna somehow it. let people do it i didn't tap it but i it, this is kind of well, awkward i can't tell you how i know this but <laughs> no no it's okay I, <laughs> I i actually so i i when you talk about there being a desktop environment on arm to me that's 50 50 because there are certain things that have to happen in that part of the os that just you know uh device drivers have yep. to happen there has to be a way for that to happen you can't write a device driver in WinRT, so there has to be something. But Microsoft has been really specific about how, the even while well, being very vague about other things, that these versions of Windows 8 on ARM are designed specifically for the different ARM chipsets and devices, that there will be no like single ARM version of Windows 8, that they have to really tailor these things to each of the device, well, I guess the device platforms is maybe the way to say yep. it. So, right. so that there is a desktop is just, that's just part of the story. Right. I, I, I would be super surprised if you as a developer could write a, um, you know, whatever it is, a, a utility or application or something that would target all of those ARM chips and x60, you know, x86 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I keep saying, and I, I don't know how this is going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually. Um, but I, I keep hearing it's, a, it's going to be allowed and, um, not not encouraged so much. Like they really want people to go metro, as we said at the start. But um, they're not going to close the world off to existing legacy developers who don't want to go metro. And they're they're going to find some way to do this. And you know, what's what's a little disconcerting to a number of people who who've heard me talk about this and blog about this. They said, "Well, I don't want that. I don't want that to be the case. <laughs> I don't. I want." I want ARM to be Microsoft's iPad competitor, Windows 8 on ARM, yeah. and I don't want exactly. them yeah. to let the de it, it legacy be, apps on them. It would be so Microsoft for them not to just do it the right way, you know. <laughs> I, I like I, I sort of like the uh, the Jurassic Park esque, you know, life will find a way, you know, like um, <laughs> developers will find a way, <laughs> you know, and of course they will. I mean, that's absolutely true. We're they gonna will. we're there's this this build conference not only replaced. Uh, uh, the uh, developers conference, but also WinHack, the hardware conference. We're going to talk a little bit about yes. hardware. There's some hardware news as well, and a lot more. Mary Jo Foley is here. Um, I'm, I apologize for Mary Jo's audio. We're, Mary Jo, we're going to send you a Heil microphone so you sound as rich and deep 
and as pure as Paul Theroux. Oh, let's not get crazy. <laughs> Richer and deeper and purer, perhaps. I, I think what happened is I think in the trip something <laughs> bad happened in your suitcase to that headset because it's a little buzzy. And I know about it, folks, but there's not much we can myself. do about it. So we're, we're just, we'll just live with that for a little bit longer. I do want to talk a little bit about New Egg and Gazelle. They go together. You know, Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle your used gadgets. We all got a lot of them around the house, in the closet, uh, in a drawer. And NewEgg.com, the place where you get the next new tech. Gazelle it today. Get rid of that old stuff and receive a gift card for New Egg by going to NewEgg.com slash trade. What a great idea. Gazelle has over 200,000 unique items in 20 product categories. So you're pretty sure that anything you've got in that gadget drawer, uh, you could get a deal from uh, on Gazelle. If it really is inoperable and, and you can't use it at all, don't worry because uh, Gazelle will also recycle it in a responsible way. Green recycling, that means it never lands in the landfill. It never goes offshore. Every bit and piece and particle of that old gadget will get recycled responsibly. But the best thing is getting gadgets, getting rid of these gadgets, and getting money, getting a new egg card for it. And it couldn't be easier. Give me a, I, you know, I'm just curious. I just brought in my Palm Life Drive. I doubt that this is worth anything. <laughs> Your palm, what did you say? Your Palm, palm life. life Drive. It was. A, I remember that. Remember it was actually that? just a portable storage thing, essentially. No, right? no, no. It, no, like no, a, it was a full player? PDA. No, it was a full PDA. Uh, it had a five gigabyte drive on it. Uh, I, I think it powers on successfully. The problem with this one is we we can't find the uh, the cable, but it worked just fine the last time I used it. Let's just say I don't have the AC cable. Uh, I, I do have the rechargeable battery. I don't have anything else. And, boy, the price, this is fun, too. You see the graph. It actually got down to zero uh, on Yikes. June 11th, but they're it got gonna, back up to $7. <laughs> yeah, $7. And right now it's worth, it's worth about 5 bucks. Let's see. It's got a, f no, no cash oh. value. Oh, <laughs> so we will recycle that. Now I'm going to press the add it to box, and uh, we're just going to find a box and throw that in there. But I think I have some more gadgets lying around, and I'll get rid of those <laughs> too. I, well, you know what I have is, uh, let's see, an old iPhone 3GS that I just found. It was my uh, daughter Abby's, and I put, I fixed the screen. It had a broken screen on it, and I was able to fix the screen. Let's see what that's worth, shall we? 16 gigabytes. Yep can't be worth very much anyway go it's kind of fun makes calls yeah it's free of water damage it is now it's in perfect condition i have all the cables the ac adapter and let's just see what wow now that's a good deal 173 bucks for the 3gs so i'm gonna throw that in the box too you see how fun this is and then you they say they give you a mailing label you don't pay for shipping you send the box in and gazelle sends you a new egg card and you can buy all new crap it's just fantastic one of the reasons I like Newegg and I use Newegg, that's where we get all our hard drives and, and uh, bare bones PCs and things like that. Uh, all the reviews, 1.9 million customer reviews, the high res photo galleries, 84,000 products. I'm a big Newegg fan. So go to Newegg.com slash trade. It's kind of the, the meeting of the best of both worlds. Trade in your old gadgets at Gazelle. Get uh, cash for your new gadgets from Newegg and everybody's happy. Newegg.com slash trade. Trade as New Egg says, take it from a geek. <laughs> Me. Newegg.com slash trade. So um yeah, this replaces PDC, the developers conference. And so far we've talked about a lot of the developer news at Build, but there's also news for hardware. Uh this secure boot. Uh, first of all, I guess Windows is going to EFI. No more BIOS, is that right? Well, um, it will still it, support BIOS. It'll support it. both. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. But uh, e UEFI, EFI is the uh, is the booting system that uh, M Apple's Macintosh has had for some time. Yeah, it makes sense that these things would merge. I mean, Macs and PCs are essentially the same. Well, and it was an Intel standard. Plan. EFI is yeah. an Intel standard, right? It's the yeah, their MCA bus, you know, their <laughs> or uh, whatever that PS2. What was that? Was that MCA? M the, uh, yeah, microchannel architecture. Yeah, microchannel. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So UEFI, what is that? Universal Extensible Framework Initiative, is that of right? Of course it is. Unified, I think, is the word. Unified. Unified. 
Um, and and it, it's it's been a while uh, that we've been using BIOS. I think since 1990, 1981, when the first PCs were created. And it hasn't changed a lick. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't aged a day. Uh, some of the concern, and this is one I'd like to ask you about, is that you won't be able to dual boot or do Linux on uh, this secure uh, boot. I don't even, you know, I'm, I'm so amused that this is a story. Um, <laughs> is that, you know, Microsoft blocking Linux on Windows 8, you know, PCs. Like, like Microsoft is the company responsible for the, right. you know, the BIOS, the type that machine makers put on there. I, I, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, in fact, it has nothing to do with them. It's, uh, like I said, it's an Intel yeah. standard. No. I, but no, right. what a great story, though. You know, Microsoft's putting the screws to Linux. Uh, not, right. No. What? <laughs> I mean, it's like, and then someone actually, somebody apparently has asked Microsoft, so are you going to uh, support Linux as a, a dual boot type with Windows 8? And they're like, what? And of course, you know, no, they never have. What are you talking about? Why would they do that? <laughs> Microsoft screws Linux. You know, seriously? Well, no, I, okay, so wait, though, wait. <laughs> I mean, this, this post, the whole thing started from a Red Hat employee who blogged, hey, I wonder if the way Microsoft's going to have security secure boot in Windows 8 is going to end up and they not allowing us to uh, dual boot Linux. And, you know, I know there are a lot of people say, well, who cares? You know, you're buying a Windows machine. So what? You can't dual boot Linux? There, I've got 350 comments on my site right now from people who care a lot about being yeah, able to Yeah, but that's all of those Linux. people. That's the thing. <laughs> no, it's not no, all it's, of it's relevant. It's, 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 it's material. But Linux supports UEFI and has for some time. Um, and uh, no, but, but I the know notion I, that I, I know secure I'm... boot is there. In other words, the, implicitly, what we're saying is Microsoft is making Windows 8 secure boot so that we can screw Linux. Right. Like really? Right. So UEFI secure boot is not necessarily part of UEFI. This is something no. on top of it. Right. They presented these it's, two things together, right? At, it, at build it's something that requires UEFI. Yeah. And so, what is right. secure boot? That keeps the bad guys from um, modifying my BIOS. And my MBR? It, it actually, I'm a little scared of Secure Boot because what it does is, it, essentially speaking, again, generally speaking, is it, it, it takes a, a look at all of your hardware and it makes sure that everything's signed correctly. And it stores that information in that TPM chip that, that we now have in all our wonderful PCs. And the next time it comes on, it scans all the hardware and says, is everything exactly the same? And if it finds something that wasn't signed previously, it won't boot. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cynical enough that my expectation is, one day I'm going to walk up to my computer, hit the power button, and it's not going to boot, even though I have not changed anything, <laughs> and I'll never be able to fix it. That's the way I view the world. So to me, this has nothing to do with Linux. It's just yet another one of those vaguely, uh, you know, copy protection related things that's just going to end up screwing me in the end. But um, and whatever. So it's a security feature of Windows 8. You know, and, neat. And, and Microsoft has said that if you want a design for Windows 8 logo, that you'll have to support this. In other words, the hardware manufacturers still have to implement it, but to get their logo, you'll have to implement it. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't, I, that I don't know, but... I, I think they did say that at Build in that session. I think it, there was a list of criteria, you know, what are you going to have to do to get this, the logo? And one of the things was implement UF, UEFI dual boot. I mean, secure boot, sorry. But I presume you can also disable this in... I don't know what you call BIOS setup anymore. Yeah, well, we can just call it BIOS. I presume you could disable it so that if you wanted to put Linux on there or you didn't want this secure boot, the secure boot is, is for corporations and other people who want to make sure that hackers... Well, and you know where it comes from? Things like news stories that hackers could put bad code in the, uh, in the firmware of video cards, things like that. It's, sure. it's to protect you against your hardware being modified without your knowledge. Uh, a keystroke logger, for instance, put on your keyboard, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's, there, there are actually additional controls in Windows 8 to prevent the loading of that kind of stuff at boot time. You know, they have something called, uh, I think it's called Manage Boot, which doesn't require UEFI but runs after Secure Boot if it's present, that actually uh, early loads the anti-malware software that Microsoft has so that that occurs during boot time as well. So there's a lot of stuff, you know, not all of it's aimed at like screwing over Linux. I'm sure some of it is. But, I mean, it's, well, just, it's just amusing how this is, like, how the conversation goes. Like, really, you know. But, but, but um, Google implements it in the Linux-based Chromebook sure. for the same reason. It's a security measure. Not to screw Linux. Not to screw Linux, because it is Linux. <laughs> Maybe it's to screw Microsoft. Microsoft. You know they're not screwing Linux. <laughs> they're keeping, they, you better not put Windows on our Chromebook. Although Google does apparently mandate that there is a physical switch on the Chromebook that disables this secure boot. So I think having the secure, although now now I got to ask, well, 
gosh, if you can turn it off, what's the point? But, right. <laughs> but I mean, I think if you're a corporation, this might be something that you do want enabled uh, and, and would turn it on. And I guess so. Like you TPM know, I, in general. TPM is something. I would mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, there, Microsoft has all this technology designed at protecting data that's stored on hard drives and protecting information on computers, protecting information, I'm sorry, protecting computers from being attacked. What is the, uh, you know, the usage of these technologies in corporations today? I bet they're still pretty low, you know, low usage. And I think it's probably because a lot of corporations are still uh, mixed environments with lots of older computers and so forth. So uh, I don't, it's not like Microsoft does something and we all just immediately use it, you know, and, and then Linux, you know, suffers as a result. I mean, I, I this is just an ongoing thing that Microsoft does every version of Windows. We have, you know, more security, more things like this. It's just a natural evolution from what I can tell. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's a convenient, if anything, it's a convenient coincidence that it blocks Linux. I, it's exactly. a wonderful, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bullet point on a slide somewhere. <laughs> it's, a, it's a happy accident. It is certainly not the intent. <laughs> We're having twins. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, and by the way, it's a happy and accident. One more thing. <laughs> Windows ain't done till Linux won't run. Um, oh, <laughs> did, did I say Jeez. that? Oh, oh. Um, you want to talk about uh, C++? You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> there was some fear that game developers might have to learn C++. That is not the case, right? Well, I don't know. It's somewhat of the case because, it, okay, first, first I need to do a little rant about Microsoft and disclosure policy around Windows 8. Um, and Paul's like, oh, no, this is never going to end. <laughs> <laughs> was actually, uh, go ahead. And go another ahead. thing. Okay. And another thing. Um, so, you know, I, I understood why Microsoft was being very secretive about Windows 8 up until build. You know, they wanted to do the big reveal, a la right. Apple. They wanted right. to keep something secret. But now they've talked about a lot of these things. They've talked about, you know, secure boot, and they've talked about desktop support on ARM. But there's a ton of confusion out there right now. And when we're asking for clarification on things that they announced at build, they're saying no comment. And it's just kind of perpetuating a lot of um, mysterious, um, in, incomplete information, I feel like. And here's one of those cases. You know, I've, I've had several people say to me, so is Microsoft going to continue to allow people who are used to developing games for Windows Phone and indie games to use XNA, their game development framework? I believe the answer to that is no. On Windows 8. And I believe Microsoft is telling developers you need to learn C++ in order to develop games going forward for these platforms. Not just Windows 8, but also Windows Phone. And when I've tried to get some clarification on that, I got a no comment. So I don't know if Paul, with his background sources, that he seems to be able to access that I cannot. <laughs> Can I was just going to say, you can expect a phone call, Mary Jo. <laughs> Pretty good, but the read the Riot Act phone call. <laughs> I don't I, have I'm any just, uh, information about this topic. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the answer is they are going to encourage people. You know, even before Build, we, we had the um, kind of the sense that Microsoft believes there's going to be a resurgence and a renaissance around C++. Not um, C Sharp, C++. No, C++. That's crazy talk. I know. <laughs> but I That's mean, like, That's her. <laughs> XNA really is for lighter weight games. You wouldn't develop, you know, Quake 4 in XNA or. or, or uh, right, but neither would you use C, C. I mean, C has its own baggage as well. It's not exactly the. Well, it, down is, and how dirty most, it is how most games are developed right now. Most high end mm, games. I bet are they're C++. a combination of C, C, and assembly. Oh yeah, there's absolutely uh, assembly under uh, I, in the, for I, optimization, of course. But C++ probably is the is the primary language for most games. I, I don't know. Think. I'd be curious in finding out what's the story there. I, I to me, I I always felt like C++ since .NET came around has been somewhat deprecated in the Microsoft world, right? Because yeah. you know, obviously they created their own language, um, or mm -hmm. Anders Heilberg did, and it's great. You know, I mean, if, if C-sharp ever had a problem, it's that it was running on top of a thing which was running on top of a thing. So you kind of had that uh, performance issue. And 
I would, I don't know for a fact, but I would imagine in the WinRT world that that goes away somewhat, you know, that it becomes even more viable. Um, C sharp is for .NET only then? Well, C Sharp is uh, was developed for .NET. You know, it's a managed code language. But so according you could write to write a game in C Sharp, you could probably write anything in C Sharp. I mean, it would just be a, a question of performance. I mean, obviously, game developers, if you're a first tier game developer writing a, a major blockbuster game, you want to wrench as much performance right. as you can out of that. And you're not going to write it in C Sharp, as good as the language is. Yeah, yeah. I think I think this came up more. Um, Again, from people who have been developing for Windows Phone, you know, when Microsoft first laid out the development platform for Windows Phone, they said, you know, most things use Silverlight. If you want to develop a game, use XNA. That was that was basically how they presented the development platform for the phone. Well, but so, X, so people, XNA is a framework, though, right? What's right. you're still writing in an XNA game? I would imagine is still C sharp, isn't it? I do not know that. I would, chat I would room, think, chat room, I, they'll know. Yep, XNA is just a framework. I mean, I, I I assume that you can use VB, C Sharp, whatever is supported on that platform. I don't think, I don't yeah. know, but I, I would be surprised yeah. if you could write Wiki, a Wikipedia C++. Says, XMA, XNA is a set of tools with managed runtime environment provided by Microsoft that facilitates video game development. So you're right. You, you hit the nail on the head. It is a framework. But what does yeah. it say about language? Let's search for the word language. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, framework, 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 framework. <laughs> framework. <laughs> Games that run on the framework can technically be written in any .NET compliant language, yeah, but only C Sharp go. in XNA Game Studio Express IDE and all versions of Visual Studio 2008 and 2010 are officially supported. VB.NET was added in 2011. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so C Sharp, C -sharp and VB. Or that, VB. That's, yep. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I would expect. Right. All right. But now, so, you know, on with a Windows game, though, 8. Yeah. With Windows 8, the message sounds like it is, uh, we want you to, if you're doing a game, a Metro game or um, something you previously might have thought about using the XNA framework to develop along with some managed code, um, we want you instead to go C++. All right, so based on what you just said, and I think we need to bring up your one of your many architectural diagrams again. Here comes make, the slide. I will make <laughs> oh, the, following, God. Uh, the following bit of semi-educated <laughs> speculation, which is this. Um, based on the, the, the diagram that you had that you said was from a former Microsoft-y, uh, yes. it looked like there was a .NET uh, CLR sitting between C Sharp and WinRT. Whereas if you were going to develop it in C++, according to that diagram, C++ would go directly to WinRT. Uh, maybe there's a little bit less overhead there and that that was the theory. But I, you know, it makes sense on a phone. You could write it in uh, Visual Basic or C Sharp. Who cares? We're talking about a little device with a fairly small amount of RAM and processing power. You know, obviously on the PC, it's a different story altogether. I was saying earlier, you know, Microsoft told me that any game could be written or any application could be written to this Metro style UI that, uh, or, you know, this WinRT environment. And, you know, maybe at that point, XNA is not the solution, right? Because those are, would be for simpler right. games. That's by kind of my sense of it, yeah. Yeah. By the way, I'm trying to pull up the slide on your site, Mary Jo, but Explorer for Windows is really 8 bad? Cannot, it won't display it. Oh. I think it's my probably got flash Microsoft on. has finally banned Mary Jo. <laughs> it's been a long it's time actually, in it's in, the, it's in the blacklist, <laughs> you know. It's an in, in the box feature. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's like a little button on the Windows 8 start screen. It says block. Block. Yeah, it's Joe. actually, a, it's like a picture of your face with a circle and a line through it. <laughs> exactly. No. I'm sure there's flash or something on the web page that it's, it does not like it. There could be. There is there are some flash ads, and I think that's probably yes. what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although why it would reject the whole page, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Well, let's go. I'll, back I'll look to into the C sharp, the C plus plus thing. I don't know. I, I'd not heard this. So, I, no, what, I what they should do is they should allow C plus plus on XNA at the framework. Then everybody be happy, and or allow you to use your language of choice. I suppose. Right. Yeah. You, you whatever. And then technically, I guess you can, but it kind of favors C sharp and VB. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, in in the sense that uh, some of the most popular games in the world right now, are those Facebook style games or web based right. games or Flash based games. Right. You know, all those things, those are XNA would be perfect yeah, for that. It yeah. would be great, even. Yeah. I mean, there are some incredible games on Windows Phone, the beautiful games. So it's not like, you know, we're not talking about, again, about Hangman versus Call of Duty. You know, it's that, that there's some middle ground there, too, right? right? So 
I, I think that, um, yeah, here we go. The XAML sits on top of the... So you see how C and C++ are put in the same box, which I'm right. intrigued by because C++, by definition, actually has to sit on top of C because, you know, <laughs> right. it, 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 it itself Freak has compiler. frameworks that are abstractions of C APIs. We'll never have a, a complete architectural no. diagram. That By the says. way, Windows itself is on, almost certainly written in C++. Yes, I believe well, it, it is. It, it's a combination of things, I would say. Well, yeah. of course, but I would bet the vast majority of code mm. is C++. It's, code. It's, I believe it's still P code from the old VB days. <laughs> <laughs> it's written in Pascal. Everybody you knows that. Laporte, you obviously <laughs> don't know anything about if the history of If you knew Windows. anything. <laughs> Windows Live, Wave 5. Is this for Windows 8 or what? It's yeah. in the Windows 8 another, section. Another one of these mystery things, right? <laughs> um, we kind what? of, we, well, no, we did see a demo at Build of some very early um, examples of where they're going with the next version of Win the Windows Live apps and services. Um, and they even did a blog post this week on the Windows Live uh, blogs kind of reiterating what they showed last week. But we don't, there's more, way more that we don't know about Windows Live wave five which is the next version of it than what we do know i mean uh, people are asking me so many questions on like are they are you going to be able to do this you know when they show the mail app what is that exactly is it going to work like it works on the phone i mean so many things it's it's one of those we'll see as they further into the um process of developing it in other words how metro is windows live going to be on we think it's going right. to be very and metro very right? metro but well but what about windows 7 so Yep. Will there be a version of the mail app that runs uh, in the classic desktop environment? Yes, and will yep. that also install a Windows 7, which you would hope and mm -hmm. think? Or does that mm -hmm. stuff just kind of stop? You know, are we, right. are we done? Is, is, you know, the version of Windows Live Essentials that out, is out now for Windows 7, is that it? Mm -hmm. A lot of questions. And as far as the services go, you know, they showed off SkyDrive, essentially, which they've already updated this year very recently. Okay. But what about, you know... What about all that other stuff? What about Hotmail? What about, you know, the various Windows Live services that are out there? There, there are many of them still. Yeah. So what's, you know, what's going on? We don't know. We don't know. I'm just trying to put my mug in my cup holder. Is that, what is that? Is it like a... <laughs> it's a floppy drive cup holder. Oh, I see. Yeah. You like that? Hey. Wouldn't you like one of them? Wow. I would, but it would have to keep the, does it keep the cup warm? No. You'll have to add I don't a understand the point USB of this. adapter. The point of it is you can't knock it over. It's got a, it's like a uh, suction oh, wow. cup and you can't, and it looks like, and when you're done, you fold it up and it looks like you got a stack of floppies on your desk. How uh, cool is that? Wow. How much would you get if you sold that on uh, Newegg.com slash trade? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they have a category for it. <laughs> cup holders. Hmm. All right. Uh, let's take a break. Uh, I have we done every said everything there is to say about eight now. Never. Never. No. Oh, you know what? There's a whole new topic: Windows Server eight, and that's coming up <laughs> in just a second. Paul actually has some. Uh, you had two days of briefings, Mary Jo says. I did. As if she's jealous. I oh. was. I wanted to be there, but I was on a blocked list. <laughs> Remember that scene in Planet of the Apes where the guy had, like, the lobotomy scar? <laughs> That's what I looked like after those two days. So everything about Windows Server 8 will be revealed momentarily. Yes, get ready for Metro on your server. But first, a word from Squarespace.com, the secret behind exceptional websites. If you are uh, embarking on a search uh, for the next website host... Uh, for the next content management system, I would like you to take a look at squarespace.com. This is hosting, the best hosting there is out there. They're really remarkable. In fact, they do not get enough credit, I think, for the quality of hosting they offer, uh, mostly because they're not a generic web host. They host Squarespace sites, and that's it. But you cannot take a Squarespace site down. You never hear about security issues because Squarespace keeps that software up to date automatically. And it's the best content management software out there. It's all uh, Java-based, Java virtual servers, Java code. Um, it runs Actually, that does. I don't even need to tell you that because you don't. You won't know that in any way. It doesn't affect you. But if you go to squarespace.com, here's what you want to know. You can click that green "Try It Free" button and have full access to all the features of Squarespace for two weeks, absolutely free. You don't even need a credit card. All you need is a name for the site, a password, and an email address. 
And now you can try the 60 plus designers style sheets. You can try the Android and iOS. Yes, they have Android now, iOS uh, apps for posting and for moderating. You can even get stats, very nice stats in your portable device, your iPad too. Great social integration, widgets for all the big social networks, photo galleries, form building, data collection, and forums, all of that at squarespace.com. And very affordable. Remember, you're getting hosting plus the software for as little as $10 and I think 33 cents in a month. But if you do decide to sign up after you do the free trial, and I encourage you to do the free trial first, you'll be able to take 10% off the cost of your Squarespace site for the first six months. The longer you sign up, the less it costs. You can go monthly, yearly, or get 20% off by subscribing for two years. It is just fantastic. It is very powerful stuff. But I think you should look around. I think you should shop around. But just I just want you to include in your tests as you go around the net looking for the next great web host, squarespace.com and that green try it free button. Set up a site for 15 days. It's so great. You're going to love it. Squarespace.com. And make sure that uh, when you do sign up, you use our special offer code uh, so that Paul gets credit. It's Windows 9. Windows and the number 9, and you get 10% off for the first six months of your site. That's only when you buy, though. You don't need to use it until then. Squarespace.com, the offer code Windows 9. And it's not a play on Windows 8. It's because it's September. It's the yeah. ninth month. That's all. Everybody's you cracked the code. It's like a Dan Brown novel. <laughs> the next one is nine. Hey, by the way, did they say that the name is Windows Eight? No. Yeah. They still. We still don't know what it's going to be called. I think it's telling that this thing is called the Windows Developer Preview. Not and Windows Eight. Not the 8. Windows Eight. Yes. And yet they're not doing much to dispel. I mean, that's all we're talking about these days: Windows Eight, Windows Eight, Windows Eight. So, it's a good name, Leo. I think we should run with it. I think we should too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the eight is, in the Chinese culture, eight is considered very lucky. And the other thing I like about it is eight is the number that comes after seven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's, it's obvious when I say it like that. It kind of is. See what I'm saying? Golly. You know, I ran into Andy Anako in the train station today. Oh, did you? In Boston. Wow. He was on a secret mission of his own. He, I hear he is. I don't know what he's up to. <laughs> Here he is. He just spoke at the Sloan Kettering Institute about his yes. new treatment for cancer, I believe. Oh, Maybe interesting. that's what it's all about. I don't know. Anyway, Windows Server 8 has, count them, 300 new features. Leo, I would like to enumerate through all 300 of them now. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Starting with the letter A. Break. I'll see you later. A stands for Active Directory. <laughs> oh, Active God. Directory has 117 new features. It's my worst nightmare. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> no, I, actually, this one's this one's very good. No, so I I'll give the high level overview since I wasn't Wait, he's allowed. He's really leaving. To, he left. Let's just talk amongst ourselves. Okay. Okay. So I think he's going. Did he go to the bathroom me. or something? I've always been a supernumerary in this operation. <laughs> so at the I don't know what that level. means, but okay. <laughs> I'm going to do Bring the high the level. Shark! It's Shark yes. Week on on Twitch. <laughs> We're not going to have you plank again, I promise. We're not going to do that I again. I will not plank, I promise. No. I, I am still okay. sore. I still have uh, up and yeah. down, all up and down my sciatic nerve from Yikes. planking. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, I plank every day. It's one of the things I do. Very nice. I'm <laughs> Leo LaPlanker, they call me at the gym. Here comes the Here shark. Here comes the shark. <laughs> <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> It is Shark uh, Week all this week. It's unbelievable. Week. We don't have film or video of sharks eating people or attacking. So when we call it Shark Week, all we mean is a shark will occasionally swim through the show. <laughs> and for those of you not watching on video, just imagine, if you will. God, you're losing out. <laughs> okay, so I'm taking... So we actually got through level. zero features, so let's start that server conversation, <laughs> shall we? High le at a very high level, here's what you need to know about Windows Server 8. Good. Real simple. Good. Um, the idea is Microsoft's taking cloud concepts and cloud features, and they're building them into the server. That's that's like at the highest level where they're going with Windows Server 8. Why did yes, I sit through two days of a workshop? <laughs> it was that simple, Paul. Done. I, I've done. I've explained it all. There we go. Um, <laughs> 
if I was going to say what what were some like if I had to say three out of the three hundred features, and I'm hoping Paul can drill down into these. Um, oh, see, oh, one of them, one of them is uh, where what's going on with the hypervisor Hyper V3 because that's going to be really different and a big deal in Windows mm -hmm. 8. Um, PowerShell. PowerShell, PowerShell, PowerShell. Steve yep. Ballmer's new rallying cry. PowerShell is the script language and the task automation framework that's already in Windows Server, but it's going to kind of go be PowerShell everywhere as I understand it. But Paul can yep. again I, I explain that better. I I'm really sure. like PowerShell, and I and I actually bought a book on it. and I was going to learn it because I thought this is great. Oh, Leo, Windows 8 is fortified with even more PowerShell. <laughs> PowerShell goodness. It's um, been pasteurized and homogenized. <laughs> or PowerShell. PowerShell is, is, is basically a command line language, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How does it relate to Windows scripting host and, and, and the old scripting languages? In Windows? I would say that it's essentially a replacement for okay. the old WSH. style scripting. Okay. The, the deal with PowerShell is just that it's so much more firmly ingrained in, in Windows Server 8 than it was previously in that they have far more built-in commandlets, uh, something like 2300 versus 200. Wow. In the previous version of server, but also in the new server manager, as you go through and you do management tasks, there's actually a PowerShell pane. And so as you do things, it will show you the PowerShell that's being generated by the commands that you're executing. You can cut and paste that out of there and then use it as the basis for automation scripts where you can apply that action across, you know, multiple machines, multiple users, whatever it is you're doing. And this is, of and, course, um, what sysadmins want. This is the, the power that they're... Well, using. see, I, I'm actually not positive it's what they want, but it is what they're going to get. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, isn't this kind of what you want if you're running a big, you, you want well, script let's put it this way. So to me, we only got to two of her features. I'm sorry to yeah. jump in there. But the, I was to just going to say the, storage, storage and yeah. changes around store, especially uh, pertaining to backing up to the cloud, I believe. Didn't they talk about that or not? A little bit. Yeah, the, a little bit. Yeah, yeah a little bit. Yeah. The storage yeah. stuff is huge. No doubt about it. But yeah. I, well, let's I, go through all three. I mean, you, go ahead. <laughs> you're talking about PowerShell, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that I, th there are two if you look at today's version of Windows Server, there, there are two big things going on there that I feel like a lot of people aren't really using uh, for various reasons. Actually, mostly because they're really complex um, or, or, and or limited in some way. So one of them is server core, which is this notion that the server is not going to have a, a GUI for the most part. And that it's just a command line environment. And that the reason for that is it's a smaller attack surface. And that what you can do is manage it remotely using the GUI tools either on another server or in a client that has the server administration tools installed. And that's fine, except the problem with server core is that it only supports a subset of the roles that a full-fledged Windows server can do. It's, you know, it's some of the most popular stuff, but it's not everything. So, and there's also no way to get back from that. You know, if you start with Windows Server Core and you install a couple of roles on there, you know, uh, DNS, uh, DHCP, you know, print, file, whatever, you can't, upgrade that, if you will, to a full-fledged server and get the additional roles. Like once you go down that path, you're kind of stuck. Um, the other one is PowerShell. And PowerShell is limited in the sense that they just didn't have a lot of the built-in commandlets, but it was also very powerful. And, and in some ways, I think a little too powerful for the typical admin, because really what PowerShell is, is an object-oriented software development environment. I mean, it's, it's actually really powerful, you know, .NET based objects with methods and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think this stuff was a little overwhelming for admins in the previous version, or the current, what we call the current version of Windows Server. So it's interesting to me that a lot of the big initiatives in Windows Server 8 are actually around promoting those two things even further. You know, so PowerShell now has is a much, much bigger deal. And then there's sort of a general concept in Windows Server 8 that you should never be sitting in front of a server administering it. You know, back in Windows Server 2003, they had this, you know, this kind of mantra where it was like, it's a server, not a surfboard. So they would disable IE by default. Hmm. Now it's the mantras, they didn't say it this way, but I said it this way. It's, sort of, it's a server, period. You know, you should not be sitting in front of a screen attached to a server with a keyboard and a mouse and doing stuff on the server. That right. You should always access it remotely. That's right. So Yeah, so they're, they're, they've changed the management model in Windows Server 8 so that it's multi-machine by default and that you can access all of the machines in your environment from a central console, hopefully on a PC, not, not on a server. And that everything has been designed to be automated automatable, if you will, through PowerShell, or remotable through GUI tools that sh that can and will sit on uh, a Windows client, not on a server. So it's a big conceptual change. And it sounds obvious when you say it, and it, but it also kind of makes you wonder how we put up with the way we were doing things for so long. You know, it's, it's, it's a really, really big change. 
So that's you know, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about this before uh, when we've been talking about server. You know, the idea is Microsoft more and more is pioneering a lot of new features in Windows Azure, their cloud platform, and then they're bringing them to the server. And, the, and you know, if you look yeah. at what Windows Server 8 is, this is what's happening. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that they've been trying in, on in the cloud um, is making its way to the server. And that's how they keep talking about, you know, customers want private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud. And, and they're trying to gradually yeah. kind of equalize that feature set across the different scenarios. Just something like uh, data deduplication, right? Um, back at the Windows 7 launch, Steven Sanofsky told me that Microsoft would never get into the cloud storage business for consumers because they have a billion customers. And if they gave everyone a really easy way to access 25 gigabytes of storage on SkyDrive from within Windows, everyone would do it. And then 95% of them would never even look at it again. But Microsoft would still have to both maintain and protect and duplicate all of that data because that would be the legal requirement and that there's no money to be made there. It doesn't make any sense. But part of the deal with Windows Server 8, and this is some of the learnings they got from the cloud storage stuff uh, from Azure, is this notion of data deduplication? And I don't, I don't remember numbers off the top of my head, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of, you know, rough this one out. And it's probably not exactly correct, but I want to say on an SMB file share, just turning this feature on, it's like a, it literally is a checkbox. Um, they saw something like an, eight, you know, it, it was an 83% reduction in storage space just by doing data du duplication on, on the storage. And it's interesting to me because that suggests it doesn't prove, but it suggests that maybe Microsoft could do a consumer oriented, you know, cloud storage thing, because if they can, you know, uh, get rid of data duplication to that extent, maybe it would make some sense for them uh, financially as a, you know, a service they could offer consumers. Um, anything else to say about server that you want to uh, get in before we move on? <laughs> there's, a, there's, uh, there's a lot to say. 300 about, uh, features, that's only three. <laughs> <laughs> we we yeah. tried to give you the Cliff Notes version on that. Thank There's God. some new fonts, I think. Um. <laughs> is there any say, is I, there any Metro at all? Oh, uh, actually, yes, so there is. Months ago, no. when months ago when Microsoft showed off the Windows 8 Start screen for the first time, I looked at this thing and I said, without having actually used it, this is a UI that makes sense in a lot of places. I could see it in living rooms with the Xbox, which they are doing. I could see, you know, obviously on a phone, they have it. They could put it on any type of PC. It makes sense. It would work well with mice and keyboards and pens, touch, connect, you know, whatever. And I said it would even make sense in a server situation that this UI would be a perfect UI for like a server dashboard where you could have, you know, things up about the, uh, you know, the how your environment's doing, whether the temperature of the machines is okay, whether there are any hot button issues you have to go to, et cetera. And, and sure enough, that's, that's a feature of Windows Server 8. The... The start screen from Windows 8 is there in Windows Server 8, and it, that's exactly what it is. It's a dashboard. It makes sense. Actually, it's a perfect dashboard, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Come to think of it. And also, you know, just from the standpoint of uh, managed clients, it's also a nice dashboard for uh, not so much knowledge workers, who I, I think by definition would be more sophisticated and be able to do a lot of different things. But when you have workers coming into your office and they have a very specific role and they run four applications, I mean, why not give them a start screen that just has those applications? And then they have no way to kind of screw around and do other stuff. And uh, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, just from a client perspective in businesses as well. Cool. Yes. <laughs> we got through that one, Leo. Yay, we survived. Yep. Uh, All right, feature five. <laughs> and now, come on. Um, I've, lost my, I've lost my, oh, here it is, Windows Weekly. I had lost my thread. Do um, you want to move on to some of the other topics like Google and, uh, and uh, Windows yeah. Phone? We, Absolutely. Sure. We got everything we want to get out of it. We squeezed every drop of goodness out of the Build Conference. <laughs> we did, for now. You know, we were talking, it's interesting that you should uh, note how similar uh, this Google attention is to the DOG attention, uh, DOJ attention on Microsoft more than 10 years ago. Um, yep. We noted that on This Week in Google as well. In fact, what we said is, look how, you know, the government was so worried about Internet Explorer and Microsoft monopolizing the Internet that they prosecuted them. Uh, yep. And had they just waited a few years, <laughs> it would all handle itself. <laughs> sure. And I think that's the case. Uh, so uh, did you watch the... Well, uh, the you know, testimony? that's hard to say. Actually, 
Re remember that it, IE was what brought this case to court, but ultimately it was about a more general topic, which was simply the the bundling, what they called the bundling of middleware. But really, what that means is using one dominant product to prop up these other products that never could have competed fairly in the marketplace on their own, and then giving them more of a chance to survive than they should have that they would have had in a truly open marketplace. And when you look at the Google case, it, that is exactly what they're talking about: Google overemphasizing their own products in an effort to prop them up against competitors that in an open marketplace would no normally be doing better than the Google services. It's the same. It's exactly the same, I think. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think you're right. No, I hmm. actually, that was hmm. kind of the conclusion we came to uh, hmm. yesterday. Yeah. yeah. You know, Yelp is the big example, right? And I, I, there was a great moment, I guess, in these hearings where uh, one of the senators said, you're number three in every single one of these results. You, you, the Google service is artificially always the third choice. And, you know, Eric Schmidt said, no, it's that, that's, that's a coincidence. You know, <laughs> or, or, <laughs> no, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, but, yeah, but I have to say when you search for search engines on Google, Google isn't even on the first page. When you search for Bing on Google, they give you a whole page of Bing results. Mm -hmm. Um, I, right. I think you but can carefully pick your search results to prove almost <laughs> anything. Let's put it that way. Oh, okay, well, that's yep. interesting. But uh, that I if okay, <laughs> I mean, but that's kind of a tough one because you have to use a search engine to do that. So, I yeah. see what you're saying. <laughs> I got to I got to tell you though, my my favorite part of this whole hearing um, was Google's written testimony that they submitted before it began, in which and, they compared and, themselves to Microsoft without actually using the M word. And also, I've got, I pulled this line out because it just is so ludicrous. You can't help but laugh after you hear it. Microsoft, this is from Google. Microsoft has integrated Bing into its popular gaming console, the Xbox 360, and it's in talk with cable companies to convert the sub to convert it to the set top box of the future. Microsoft Bing launched in June 2009. It's grown so rapidly that some commentators speculate it could overtake Google in 2012. <laughs> what? I was like, what? Huh? Yeah, this is in the written oh, testimony. Find, f please find that crazy person. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there is a point yeah. to be made that 30%, if you look at all of Bing's uh, supported search things like, you know, Yahoo and so forth. It's like thirty percent of the of the search. It's, Google's only sixty five percent. Bing has come on pretty strong. You know, this is like the Apple argument, though. You know, on the Apple on the Mac side, uh, the Mac may only represent you know five percent of the market in the world or whatever it is. You know, ten percent in the United States or whatever. But but they make a lot more money per unit sold, so it's it's a great business. Um, on the search side, Google is sixty five percent. But they make a lot more money per every search than Microsoft does with Bing. That's so true. Yeah. it really exaggerates the difference when you look at it, perhaps in a fairer way. By revenue. Right. Well, yeah. it's the point of the thing, right? It's, it's not a charity. So uh, in this case, uh, number of searches or percentage of searches or whatever uh, is one thing. But really what we're looking at in this case is, you know, how these companies make money. And Bing uh, is not making a lot of money for Microsoft, if any. No, in fact, it's a deficit right mm. now. But right. that's because yeah. they have to spend so much to, to get that market share. I mean, they're buying yeah. market share, yep. in effect. Mm. Yep. yep. That's not they're true. Investing but it's going to be, it's gonna be like fun for those of, who, uh, those of us who <laughs> sat through the DOJ trial. It's going to be fun to see um, every, yeah. all the emails come out again like they did when Microsoft was on the oh, hot they seat. They already you know? are. You know, they, they, they yeah. already are. Well, who would you it, rather? This, the parallels here are so obvious. It's just, it's beautiful to <laughs> behold. Who would you rather watch 20 hours of deposition, deposition uh, from uh, Bill <laughs> Gates or uh, Eric Schmidt? Oh, they're both horribly boring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think Schmidt, but the, the potential for Schmidt to completely go off the reservation is so is high. way higher. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where there is some, you know, tension. I think like Bill, the way that Bill Gates trained for that deposition <laughs> is they brought in a shaman and he taught him how to lower his heart rate. You know, because he was just like sort of, he was like falling oh. back in the chair. Oh. And then eventually he was like, uh. <laughs> it, it, Actually, we, it, uh, they had his dad uh, coach him, actually, who's oh, a lawyer. Very well-known yeah. lawyer. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Actually, we make uh, an operating system still? I can't remember. <laughs> What's the meaning of the word and? Yeah. That was actually in the deposition. Yeah. Here's, right. here's highlights of Bill Gates. <laughs> 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 His deposition, you weren't actually joking.
You just want you you want him at some point during this thing just to grab the microphone and be like, by the way, jerk off. I just made a billion dollars sitting here. So, but he never does that. What's your present title? But Eric Schmidt, you could do it. CEO. So, are you familiar with the Microsoft Press Computer Dictionary? No. You've never cracked open before? No. Okay. Well, I'll introduce you to it. I have here the. The heart rate. Computer I wish we had a heart rate crap. Third crap. edition, uh, dated uh, 1997. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to start uh, making whistling noises through his nose. A of source of definitions for computer uh, terms, concepts, and acronyms from the world's most respected computer software company. But I'll give you a softball. <laughs> this is all on. It's on the, so, by the way, most respected I, uh, uh, there was a point when this was over where Microsoft wrote to the press and Some said, people, uh, we are legally obligated to provide the entire set of depositions if you want them I on tape. And I said, yeah, I'll take those. And one day, you know, 21 video VHS videotapes showed up at my yes, house. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'll watch this, right? There must be something interesting in here. And oh my God, is it horrible. <laughs> You thought like watching uh, The Godfather in one sitting was tough. <laughs> this is you didn't watch horrible. it, did you? Oh, I, I started. No, I didn't watch all of it. It was too awful. <laughs> it was awful. I it can't tell if this. If Imagine I pause that. it or if it's <laughs> if it's I, I like forty hours of that or whatever it works out to. It was a crazy. It was awful. Uh, Are you familiar with uh, the Microsoft Press Computer Dictionary? No. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what that would be. No. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. Those are the good old days, Leo. Leo's sleeping now. He's he's doing a deposition. This <laughs> is <laughs> like 27 hours I, of I, this. Yeah. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> Are you familiar with the company Netscape? No, no, sir, I'm not. It's uh, marketed a web browser uh, under the trade name Internet Explorer. Is that correct? We've used the term Internet Explorer to refer to the Internet technologies and Windows as well as some standalone products we've done. Let me see if you uh, agree with uh, this definition. Oh. Uh, all right, that's enough. I couldn't. I can't resist. It's, <laughs> no, it's all. It's awful. all on YouTube. I mean, that's what's so great about it. You can watch that whole thing. <laughs> anyway, I can't wait for that stuff to come back. <laughs> do you think? Will do you think that, that, that this uh, that this antitrust lawsuit will go forward? You think? They, uh, listen. They, they, so far, Google has shown uh, it's it's an amazing thing. And in, in the same way that Microsoft has repeated over and over again, we're not going to be the next IBM. We're not going to be the next IBM. Oh my God, we're the next IBM. You know, I mean, Google is doing the same. Oh, we're not going to be the next microphone. We're not making the same mistakes. We're not the right. next one. Right. Oh, wait, we are Microsoft. Maybe it's hard not I mean, to. Maybe it's just hard yeah. not to. Yeah. It's just built in. So, uh, Mango, it's really almost here. It says that right here on my screen. It's really <laughs> almost here. See that? Look at that. There it is. Let's zoom right in that. It's oh, finally, really, really and truly, truly almost, almost here. <laughs> you know, um, we we have to get our little updates on Mango as we can, right? Because we're waiting and waiting and waiting. Wait, wait. I've and our got a Windows like months phone ago. sitting in my drawer. Well, just every time, every day I check to see. And you shouldn't. Yeah. I shouldn't? You shouldn't. Because it's not going to no. be that. Are they not going to update the focus, by the way? Are they going to? No, they are. All the phones are going to be yeah. updated. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we don't so know. So maybe a week or soon. two, a week or two, right, is going to start being pushed out. We don't know which deliciously vague. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. it's funny because you know Windows Phone RTMs and it seems like oh it's done you know and it's not not really because right. now the the partners have to add their own code to it so that process is apparently is winding down or is done and and someday soon in the next couple of weeks they'll announce that this thing's ready to go out and they'll start up their little calendar with the you know, when will I get my update? You know, here's all the phones and all the different locales. And, we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. I mean, hopefully this time it will be better than last time. Or we, we I all just want to say, about as a longtime Android uh, user, I completely understand your frustration and pain. Mm. <laughs> this is what's, this is normal. Mm. It should, this should not be broke normal. this week, didn't it, Leo? Didn't what? your iPhone oh, break? Oh, you saw those. Now, you know, those are old broken iPhones I had in a drawer. And I realized, you know, uh. I can get these fixed. And I did. And, because, uh, you know, uh, when, when you tweeted that, Brandon Watson at Microsoft saw your tweet, and he said, I'd love Leo Laporte to try a Mango phone, and I'd be happy to send him one 
Well, I have a Focus. It. I've owned a Focus on AT&T for some time now. you got to get a new he one. He wants to send you something new. Out. It's newer than the something Focus? Cool. I like the Focus. We've got a little uh, okay. Nokia flash at Bill's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really quickly. oh, an N9 would be of hmm. interest. See, I'm there just, you go. Yeah, who is this guy and how do I... Uh... Brandon Watson on Twitter. Oh, now Leo's awake. <laughs> Tweet him. Hey, Brandon. No, I would love to see if it's going to be that that big screen Nokia. Like, we can't guarantee it's going to be the Nokia, but I, yeah, definitely a new Win, uh, Windows Phone Seven Five phone. Sure, but I like yep. the I, hello Mango. I like the <laughs> hello. I like the I don't know what that lady was. Mango just wandered through. How to how eat a mango? Eat a I think you've got this the is wrong how, mango. This is how uh, when search goes wrong. Right <laughs> this is a Bing ad right now. Mango fruit, mango tango, mango lassie, mango. So, um, got, no, but I am looking forward to the update on the Focus, and I presume AT&T will push it out at some day. At some no, day, but you, uh, a new hardware would be nice because uh, Mango supports some features that won't be in the ah, old phone. So Front there would be some, there would be some uh, desire for that. Yeah. And, and yep. uh, to answer your question, Gibbs, I did pay for that Windows uh, phone. That Windows, I went to AT&T the day Windows Phone 7 shipped. And it Who was me didn't? and another guy. Who didn't? <laughs> Two guys in line. It was a short line. <laughs> and he was a Microsoft hey, hey, certified. Uh... Full line. <laughs> Technically, several people were waiting. <laughs> yeah, there, were, there were people in line. It was a crowd. It was a crowd. It was, it was not just yeah. me. No, not just me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, I wasn't the only one waiting in line. You see how you can kind of finesse? Yes. Yes, I do see how you can finesse. Um, so you, so you're saying that it would be worth getting new, uh, new hardware for that. Yeah. And by the way, I'll throw, here's a, a general windows phone thought I'll throw out. Um, right. obviously windows phone hasn't set the world on fire from a sales perspective yet, but yeah. I, I think as I like it, your optimism. Well, but here's why I'm optimistic. Uh, well, it, beside the fact that I love it, I mean, I, and I genuinely really prefer it. Um, aside from that, I think that when windows eight gets out in the world and people see these things on tablets and all over the place, and they discover that, wait, I can get this kind of thing on a phone as well. I, I actually think there will be an uptick for Windows Phone. Oh, I agree. I, I think it's pretty yeah. clear, in fact, that Windows 8 is, is uh, you know, about building that ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to make a big difference for Windows Phone. Yeah. Right now, people look at Windows Phone and they think, well, why do they call this thing Windows Phone? I don't right. get it. And that will make a lot more sense. And plus, I think people will really like Windows 8, and that will drive people to the phone as well. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. You're, you're so cute. You know, you're Up smart. <laughs> and people like you. <laughs> you're okay with me, Paul Therott. That's all I can say. We're going to take a break uh, and come back with your picks of the week, your tips of the week, Mary Jo's code name of the week. Uh, maybe even we'll do an enterprise pick of the week. I'm feeling crazy. I'm feeling wacky. But first, uh, our video of the week. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> this is not in your this is not in your uh, um rundown but I thought it might be worth running. Oh, we got to do an ad first with some friend. Wait a minute, hold on. Oh, did you are you going to show the Zoom moment on I am uh, going to show a, the David Hasselhoff Connect moment. So wait, okay, before you do that, did you see on uh, Two and a Half Men there was a, a Zoom joke? No. So no. Ashton Ashton Kushner's character, whatever that guy's name is is uh, an internet billionaire. And what he did was he sold his business to Microsoft. Ha. And the, guy, the other guy says, really, what did, what did they do with it? I've never even heard of it. He goes, oh, no, of course not. They put it into the Zoom. <laughs> and then the guy says, I, I bought a Zoom. And he says, you actually bought a Zoom? And then he says, yeah, I, I had a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> so there was like a whole running gag about the Zoom right in the beginning of the show. This is, wow. Yeah. Wow, that just shows it's entered, uh, it's entered the consciousness of humans. Uh, this is uh, from MSNBC's In Game, I believe. David Hasselhoff creeps his way into the gaming scene by promoting Burnout Crash. He does this by strapping on a leather chicken suit while using the powers of Connect Lay an egg! to lay a giant egg to destroy an ice cream truck while hanging out with some emo rockabilly hipsters at what appears to be a Lady Gaga fan party. If you told me this was going to happen last week, I would have called you a liar. This thing is so last millennium. It's like everywhere I turn, the Hoff's eyes follow me. <laughs> I don't know where I could find this ad, but I want this ad. David Hasselhoff in a giant chicken suit. Uh, I guess this isn't the ad. This is a, this is an MSNBC story about the ad. Maybe I'll, maybe I can find the original. That is tragic. <laughs> I can only assume that this is for the Japanese market only. Yeah. 
It's got you to know, be. <laughs> that looks nuts. I'm going to search for Hasselhoff. Oh, see, you can't because there's so many entries. And chicken soup. <laughs> and, so, and so many of them are so inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> now we know what Leo's uh, Halloween costume is going to be this year. It's apparently the Burnout Crash Connect trailer starring David Hasselhoff in a chicken suit. <laughs> All right, there you go. Wow. Wow. I don't know if I can find that trailer, but uh, if I can, I will, I will get on it. And we will play it. We will play it because we know you want the breaking news. But first, a word from Hover.com. <laughs> H-O-V-E-R. Actually, if you go to windows.hover.com, uh, you can get the best deal on domain name registration out there. Because if you are moving your domains to Hover.com, for $10, you can extend that domain name registration for another full year. Uh, and uh, I don't care where you got your domain name, especially if you got one of them fancy don name, domain names. Uh, that's a great deal. They'll also do their uh, domain name concierge service to so transfer all your uh, all your domains over to Hover.com. Pantsforsale.com. I just want to show you the the new feature where you can see what domains are available. There's the you know the, it's the unused domains, but nowadays almost everybody has got some domain. That they're squatting on so they will also show you domains that somebody owns but is willing to sell with a star next to it so you see that there are some available ones but look this one pantsforsale.com has a gold star next to it the reason is somebody already owns pants for sale who would have thought dot com but they are willing to sell it to me and that's how hover can uh, give you a premium domain name they also have a clunker trade-in how many of us have registered domain names that we no longer want the Clunker Domain Trade-In will actually refund all the money you spent on that domain name, your origin original registration fee, and any renewal fees. If you registered them or renewed them at Hover and you want to upgrade, they'll take your old domains back. Isn't that nice? Windows.hover.com. Oh, my. There's the premium domains information on the Hover. Dot com. It's really a great registrar. Very simple, very clean page, and they don't get in your way, and very affordable, too. Take a look. Windows.hover.com. And uh, thank them for their support of Windows Weekly, by the way. All right. We are going to... Do, 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 do. Wait a minute. If you need a standard domain name, and if you use the offer code Windows, you'll get 10% off the price of the domain name as well. I didn't even know that. So here's an additional... We want to thank Hover for supporting this show for so long. And you want to see the uh, you want to see the you bought a Zunes clip. I, ha I think there's I also a great one if you haven't seen it on Family Guy, where uh, which is also very funny. <laughs> so, just out of curiosity, how does someone get to be worth so much money? Well, it's pretty simple, really. You ever hear of Blungogo.com? No. And you never will, because Microsoft bought it from me for $1.3 billion. And then they bundled it with their iPod killer, the Zune. Really? I don't think it came with my Zune. You bought a Zune? <laughs> I had a coupon. This is a little laugh, I guess. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right, let's move, let's move right along. You bought a Zune? Uh, the That's mirth like a, and uh, That's good. Okay. The gags and laughs come fast. This is a great fast. Family Guy Zoom joke, too. You should look that one up. You that know, I fantastic. can't play the Family Guy anymore because whenever we play Family, any Fox material on any of our shows, YouTube immediately yanks the entire show. So basically, the rich old guy goes up to Bill Gates and he says, Hey, Bill, you know, could you give me some help with my Zoom? And he goes, Oh, sure, I'd be happy to help. He says, I don't have a Zoom. I have an iPod like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's move right along okay. to our picks of the week, Mr. Paul Thorat. So I've written a couple of articles, and I'll write a couple more about using Windows 8 on more traditional PCs, right? Because obviously everyone's looking at this and thinking, yeah, that's neat, but I don't have a touch screen. And actually, you know, one of the conversations I had with them last week was uh, Microsoft said, look, we, we get it. Uh, the people who are going to use Windows 8 the most are going to use laptops. You know, they're not going to have touch screens. So wow. they are, in fact, designing it for mouse and keyboard and it's just not obvious, you know, how some of that stuff works. So I've only written two so far. One is about uh, Windows key shortcuts, you know, things you can do with the Windows key. Uh, one of the tips I got from Microsoft is that moving forward, you can expect more keyboard shortcuts related to the Windows key. 
so there's going to be some of that stuff, and then also using the mouse because some of the stuff just works differently with the mouse. Like for example, I need this. Yeah, accessing the charm. So right, uh, that stuff's just up on the super site. You can check it out. I'm going to read it. Winsupersite.com. One, the cool key. I will say the cool keyboard command. I guess the one really unique one is Windows key plus C, brings up that charms list. You know the list of the, you know the things that come up on the edge UI. The yeah, <clears throat> start, yeah, yeah, share, yeah, 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 yeah. all that. That's Windows key plus C. That's good. I need that. Um, and is this in the Windows 8 Developer Preview Mailbag Special Edition section? No, it's not, sir. But if you look over <laughs> on the left, uh, you'll see the you scroll down a little bit. Yes. Oh, too late. I, I, I clicked on the I clicked on the other thing. That is also a great article, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> let, me, um, let me go back in time. Oh, this this one of these oh, days. I, if we if we could all go back in time. Yes, if great. we could just start over again and just forget that Mark Zuckerberg even was here. Uh, I, oh, plus than, yeah, I, yeah. Here we go. All right. Anyway, your your software pick of the week. I'll They're on get there. The so up in a second. the other one is obviously uh, uh, people are concerned with Windows 8 with some of the UI changes, and I think one of the things that's going to happen over time is that programmers and enthusiasts are going to figure out ways to bring things back, and there there are various tips for overcoming the lack of a traditional start menu and all that kind of stuff. I have to say, one of the things I miss in Windows 8 is actually start menu search. Because I agree, I agree. Yeah, it's it's the one thing I miss. Like I I don't need the start menu, but start menu search would be fantastic. Um, yeah, obviously, there's the a start search menu, functionality. All you, get is you get the, the 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 things, you know. Yeah. Now, if you're if you're on the start screen in Windows 8 and you just start typing, oh, actually, well, search does come up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's, but it's not this. But it's not as helpful for the, for, for the classic apps, right. uh, which is the problem. So. Uh, I, I kind of miss that thing. Anyway, so the the first of what will no doubt be a long line of tweak UI style apps for Metro and for right. Windows 8 has occurred, and it is called Metro UI Tweaker. And, you know, I, I don't honestly, you can play with it and, and obviously use it at your own risk and all that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the things you can do with it is blow away the start screen and just use it as a traditional Windows 7 style desktop. Why you would want to do that, I don't know. But I believe you wrote an article, my friend, that said, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do that, you get, you just don't get. You it. lose things, yeah. So this actually automates that process for you if you oh, want it. Nice. But, but one, I think the the big piece of functionality that's in there that's very important and is not currently available in the developer preview is the ability to arbitrarily pin anything to the start menu, any app, and you could navigate through the file system, find a random app somewhere. You know, for example. Um, uh, you know, Computer and Explorer and a few of the other uh, classic desktop apps are currently pinned to the start screen. But what happens if you unpin one? How do you get it back? Right. You know, there's no obvious UI or any UI, I don't believe, uh, to pin that stuff other than going through search, right? You can go through the search in Metro and pin that way. But some apps don't actually turn up uh, in that search, which is the problem with it. So uh, using this UI, you can pin any app, and that's kind of a neat thing to have. So... It's a useful tool even just for that. But, you know, for those people who do want to play around with Windows 8 but don't want the start screen, I guess uh, I don't recommend it, but there do, it is. Do you imagine that there will be a switch in Windows 8 to do that just for businesses and others that don't want to? So, yeah, actually, that's an interesting point. I had heard very early on that there wouldn't be, but I just talked to a guy from Microsoft um, yesterday who told me point blank that there would be. Uh, and also the uh, group policies there to control what appears on the start screen. Um, and, th and that was previously up in the air. They've been very vague about this, but, but what he told me was that uh, people that use Active Directory and Group Policy would be able to control exactly what is on that start screen as well, which I think is very useful. It, it seemed like that was had to be a, the case, because if you're in a business, as much as you want to move forward and use the latest version, you, you, you also don't want to train people, right? Well, that's the thing. And if, if people face a training cost with Windows 8, that's reason enough not to deploy it. But if they can deploy it in such a way that it resembles Windows 7 and they can have this mixed environment where to the users they really can't tell the difference, um, that's fine. And I, and I think that is the plan, yeah. By the way, this just in, uh, Meg Whitman has is officially, yes, the new CEO. Oh, man. We did it. <laughs> oh, my God, of HP. I don't. I didn't think things could get any worse, but uh, Leo Apotheker apparently, I, you know, these guys clearly don't know how to make good decisions. So this is in keeping, I think, with their prior announcements. Unbelievable. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, I'm not not a slam on Meg Whitman. I think she was a good CEO at eBay, but it just seems as if the, See, I'm the not actually HP, positive about that. HP board. Well, I don't know. I, you know, they should have yeah. brought back Mark Hurd. 
he seems like he was doing all right. Yeah, because, it could have been one of those, you know, we're sorry. Yeah. Um, we're sorry. <laughs> wow. So that is official. We'll have all the details on TNT in about an hour. This is, well, at least it's still a soap opera. Now we have something to write about. Wow. Yeah. It's, we're going to look back. And so think of, you know, it's like we have HP, we have Yahoo, Netflix, <laughs> right? Netflix. This is like, these guys, uh, <laughs> they need psychologists. <laughs> you know, this, it, it's unbelievable how dysfunctional these companies are. <clears throat> well, thank God Microsoft's still around to show us how a company ought to be run, gosh darn it. Thank you. Speaking of which, <laughs> I'm not pandering to the audience. Speaking of which, it's time for our Enterprise Pick of the Week. Yes, and you know, this relates back to Windows 8. Um, and some, it was funny, at Build, you know, Build was a developer's conference, as we've noted, but my, it, it, there was almost no fanfare there for Microsoft's first developer preview of Visual Studio, what they call Visual Studio 11. That's the code name for it, which will probably be called Visual Studio 2012 when it's introduced. Um, and I, I was just really surprised. I don't know if Paul was. It just felt like, oh, yeah, and by the way, we have a new version of Visual Studio. And it was just kind of like a, a very um, small part of the announcements um, at the show. But it's actually a pretty interesting release of Visual Studio because of a lot of the new HTML5 and JavaScript and CSS tooling that they're adding into Visual Studio. And of course, the reason they're doing this is to try to get um, professional developers to have more tooling for writing Metro apps for Windows 8. Um, so it, that's that's kind of an interesting sidelight, you know. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the coming version of Visual Studio, um, including a lot of enhancements around Visual C++ and. Again, as we talked about earlier in the show, Microsoft's really pushing C++ more again. Um, and so if, if you're at all interested in doing any kind of um, professional development, the uh, preview bits are available for download now. And I would say it's going to track pretty closely alongside the uh, schedule for Windows 8. So probably something you're going to have come out next year. Whoa, there's the shark. <laughs> In, you, you have like a PlayStation controller in, for that? Or in Russia, <laughs> shark jumps you. <laughs> so, so uh, the shark's hiding. We can't get it on any any shot. There he is. I spoke too soon. Um, and your <laughs> Windows or Microsoft code name of the week? Yes. <laughs> the, the code name of the week is something called Office Talk. Whatever could that um, be? Whatever could that be? Um, well, Microsoft has inside of the Office division of the company something called Office Labs. It's uh, one of their kind of, um, you know, secret development organizations where they launch a bunch of trial projects to see if they can get any of them off the ground. And one of the things out of Office Labs uh, that seems to be gaining some traction is this thing called Office Talk. Uh, now, what it is, what it is, is something that's sort of like. Salesforce chatter, or or some people say it's like Yammer. It's kind of like a combination of... Yammer with a business Twitter. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like a combination of um, Twitter and um, and uh, activity feeds for business users. Um, the reason I made that my tip of the week, I mean the codename pick of the week this week, is because Microsoft has said that they're going to introduce something very much like Chatter and Yammer with the next version of their CRM product, which is coming out later this year. Well, of course, so Salesforce I'm, does that. So, yeah, it makes sense. They do. Yeah. Yep. And I think we're going to see Microsoft CRM look a lot more like Salesforce. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if Office Talk is kind of the missing link here. I don't know if it is or isn't, but um, that's my codename pick of the week. I like it. Office Talk. Uh, hey, we've wrapped up this edition. Uh, hard to believe, but we have, of Windows Fair Weekly. Thing. It's Shark Week on Twitter, Fair just a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> All week long. <laughs> he'll, he'll be gone by next week, I promise. Uh, Paul Therott is the editor-in-chief of the Super there Site for Windows. I did find your article, by the way, uh, on using your mouse in Windows 8, and I am going to... It's surprising pictures. on my website that it took you any time at all to find that article. <laughs> it was right there on the left. You told me. Yes. Uh, I just got distracted by other great Windows 8 articles on your site. See, that's the problem. There's just too much goodness. I know. There is too much. Yeah. Too much stuff. I got I to gotta do less. It's the super site for Windows kids. Winsupersite.com. Paul's also the author of Windows Phone Secrets and soon Windows 8 Secrets. He's right now, he's looking for the secrets. 
I am looking for secrets. If you have secrets that you would like to share, you I have set up a secrets hotline. Have you really? No. I should. I you should, should. That's actually a good idea. You know about the secret shark in Windows 8, don't you? <laughs> actually, I will tell you a little secret. <laughs> He's going under the table. <laughs> I'm all scared now. Yes, what is the little there, secret? There are hidden eights all over Windows 8. Oh, yeah. See, maybe they were everywhere. Windows 8. They're yeah. little things that are, there are eight things in different places all over Windows 8. Are there are eight of them? No. Oh, no, there are more than eight, but oh. there are lots of them. Cool. But there, cool. The point is there are hidden right. eights, secret so, eights, we might call them. Secret eights. So you'll have to look deeply. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm. Maybe we'll be in a book someday. <laughs> <laughs> I see a chapter. <laughs> Mary Jo Foley writes about Microsoft, all about Microsoft, when, when she uh, is on her blog at ZDNet. Just go to allaboutmicrosoft.com and you'll see all the postings there. And, you know, it's funny because I was looking for your posting on charts. And since you wrote that one, you'd written like 18 more. So it's just like you are you're prolific, to say the least. <laughs> So thank you both for being here. Thanks for putting up. We were a little late on the show because we were watching Mark Zuckerberg perform on stage at the F8 conference. Uh, so thank you for your patience. We got a late start on that one. And we will see you. Normally we do the show 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, every Thursday at twit.tv. That's 1800 UTC. But, of course, if you miss the uh, recording of the show, the live broadcast, you can always get a recording on twit.tv. Make sure you subscribe because it's a great show. One of my favorites. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekend. He's got, he's very finicky. Well, he's a shark, Leo. Don't expect him to be like people. It's so much fun. You got to get these for your kids. It's so much fun. Thank God my kids never watch this show. <laughs> daddy, daddy, I want a shark. <laughs> It doesn't have any steering motor. You just have to learn how to swim like a fish. Mm.